Okay, so this is lecture 39 of ECE 5312, and so what we're going to do in this lecture is we're going to revisit OFDM. Okay, you know I'm going to revisit it because I'm very passionate about this type of digital transmission. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, in a little bit more detail like how OFDM works, okay? So we saw before how OFDM, so the punchline is, um, if I can write it, divide and conquer. Sounds almost like Vikings, right? What OFDM does is essentially what it does is it transmits across narrow band frequencies in parallel in a channel and what happens is the aggregate of all those narrow band low data rate signals equals something very high. So you might say, oh, what's one or two bits per symbol? Or what is one or two, you know, um, what, what's a few hundred kilobits per, per, per second uh, per subcarrier? Is it, is it a big deal? Well, if you have 1,024 of them, it's actually a huge deal, right? Or if you have like 4096 of them. So what happens is OFDM has this divide and conquer strategy where you can either send a single transmission across a very wide bandwidth and you'll have a, a lot of issues, especially at reception, trying to deal with all the distortion that occurs across such a wide bandwidth. Or you can submit all that information in narrow band transmissions and parallel frequency bins. And what happens is all those little frequency bins get individually distorted independently, especially if they're narrow enough, and you reconstitute it at the receiver into a single aggregate transmission. Okay? So, we saw, like, you know, that's what I just described. So let's say, for instance, we're dealing with a frequency selective fading channel. That means every subcarrier is attenuated by some amount. And what's beautiful is what may look continuous in the frequency domain, like, you know, that big swoopy thing. That shows you the attenuation. The bad stuff is happening in places like here and here, right? So those are kind of like negatively impacting the data transmission occurring in those subcarriers. So this is a subcarrier, and that's a subcarrier, and they're not doing so well. Even the guys kind of nearby, these guys are getting attenuated, right, by the frequency selective fading channel. Frequency selective fading channel. So what's happening is, on the other hand, you have some subcarriers that are doing dandy because the attenuation is approximately flat and is not really affecting them all that badly. What's interesting is, imagine if your single carrier transmission was operating across the same channel how you would resolve it. You would use a really complicated equalizer, right? On the other hand, with OFDM, how you would solve this? Simple complex gain. Simple complex gain that inverses the attenuation caused by a channel. Now, if there's noise, you get noise enhancement. So what do you do in that case? You just put the complex gain before it hits the distortion, so everything flattens out nicely. What's the problem with that? You need overhead information. And what's the other problem? What happens if your dynamic range of your transmitter is not so good? You know, so there's no free lunch. But OFDM is still pretty cool. <laughs> okay. So we saw how this fading can be compensated by a collection of single tap equalizers. Oh, what's the other thing that you have to keep in mind? You have to have a lot of, a lot of subcarriers because the more subcarriers you have for the same finite bandwidth, the smaller its perspective on the channel it appears to it, and what happens is the more flat. Because imagine if I look at this entire channel, I'm going to see all those dips and stuff. But if I look at just one narrow sliver, it approximately looks flat over that range of visible, like, you know, the visible range that I can see. But what's the problem with that? So what's the implementation of OFDM and FFT? What, what's the complexity of a, 496, a 4, 4096 point FFT versus a 256 point FFT? Even though it's base 2, it's still kind of big, right? So there's complexity and implementation hardware resource issue, if you will, that kicks in. Okay? So 
I've sort of provided the pros and the cons of this technology. I did not talk about this one con until now. And what is that? Doppler spread. So what is the problem with OFDM? What happens is it's very sensitive to how you sample it, right? It's very, very sensitive. So if you have Doppler spread, what happens to the center frequencies, right? So as a result, this creates some problems, especially in mobile environments. Remember, several years ago, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to think, I th it was definitely in Korea. They were trying to push a standard. I think it was called like Y, y Bro or Y Pro. It was basically take Wi-Fi and its wonderful data rates and now apply it to highly mobile platforms. So LTA supposedly supports very high speed mobile systems like bullet trains or people driving down the Mass Pike and stuff like that, right? Um, and I think in about 2004, 2005, the North Korean, no, not North Korean, South Koreans were trying to develop a wireless technology that could support highly mobile, high speed platforms and high data rate connectivity, right? And, but now LTA is, is already time, is kind of providing that solution. Okay. So what happens is the problem with Doppler is because, because we no longer sample OFDM precisely where we want it, this now creates some issues in terms of orthogonality. And when you lose orthogonality, you have ICI or intercarrier interference. So what, what is the basic waveform that's represented in the frequency domain of an OFDM subcarrier? It is a sync pulse. What happens with a sync pulse? If you don't sample it right at the desired instant, you fall off pretty fast, right? And if you don't sample quite exactly at the right point, what you end up getting is this loss of orthogonality between subcarriers. Notice how the subcarriers really overlap very tightly with each other. That's the beauty of OFDM. It's spectrally very, very efficient. What's the downside? If you don't sample it right, all that orthogonality goes away, and that overlap now becomes a huge detriment. So there's ISI, which we talked about before. And what is ISI? One OFDM symbol smearing into another. That has its own problems because we, we use cyclic extensions to prevent that. And what I, ISI does is it makes it very difficult to extract the original signal when we have contributions from the previous and successive symbols influencing and distorting our sort of symbol we're trying to decode. ICI is a different beast because it's within the OFDM symbol, the loss of orthogonality because of incorrect sampling results in essentially we, we, we lose that orthogonality and everything, all the subcarriers smear with each other and we cannot extract the information. We cannot perfectly recover the signal back from each one of the subcarriers in those situations. All right? So let's look at the performance, shall we? Okay. So let's say OFDM, we have N subcarriers. Ah, it's some sort of frequency modulation. Nope, 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 sorry. I take that back. That's, those are basically, we, we modulate every subcarrier to FK. So this is a modulation. And we use some sort of MRE um, uh, a QAM or MRE PSK modulation. So we can either use like 64 QAM, 256 QAM, 32 QAM, like any one of those QAM modulations or PSK. So we basically are manipulating your phase or amplitude or combination of the two, all right? So what happens is, say that the subcarriers are orthogonal. What ends up happening is, what does that mean? What that means is that um, these two sort of modulation processes, there should be, they, if we multiply to two and then integrate, what do we get? Should be zero unless FK and FI are equal to each other, correct? So, and that makes sense. How do we solve for that? Easiest thing is uh, you can either multiply and then integrate from zero to T. You can also find out, like, you know, this guy's equal to cos plus J sine, and you can multiply that out that way. You can do any which way, but if you solve it, you'll in fact find that each subcarrier is orthogonal to each other. If you uh, sample them correctly, right? So, 
Now, let's take our channel impulse response. This guy is also very easy to do, too. So it's frequency non-selective fading uh, Rayleigh channel. And so each one of the channel coefficients essentially is this constant gain term. And uh, there's some delta function on it as well. And so if we have that, uh, what happens? Uh, so first of all, let's say we take the cross-correlation of these uh, sort of like attenuation terms from the fading channel. And what you'll see is if we calculate that, um, and we, we can actually factorize this guy, we can actually break him down into uh, R1 of tau and then R2 k minus i. So what is R1 of tau? Where did this guy come from? So what I did, essentially, is I'm breaking up the correlation into a temporal and a frequency correlation. So it's a, this correlation term actually has two individual correlations, one with time and one with frequency. And so if we have that, okay. So, if we, if, so what we need to do is we need to do a little bit of mathematical fun. My favorite is Jake's model. So ask Bengi about it. She's been playing with Jake's. And you, I think your work too, right? But with the paper that you guys are doing. You're using Jake's model. Oh, you're not? OK, so she's working. She, I know her journal paper. Her journal paper draft uses Jake's model. Jake's model is tried and true. Jake's model, if you want to come up with a nice scatter model, Jake's is it, right? Um, where are some good places you can find Jake's model? I think the uh, textbook by Gordon Stuber, uh, mobile wireless, uh, no, mobile communications, I think, or like um, beautiful, beautiful mathematics on, on how to drive that. It turns out that Jake's model says that this temporal correlation term is going to be equal to a zero order Bessel function of first kind. <gasps> Bessel functions. Run for the hills! You know. Now, for the second guy here, which is the frequency correlation, it turns out that this is the amount of correlation across the different subcarriers. So it has some sort of, let's say it has a form of this, exp uh, this exponential here, where beta is the coherence bandwidth of the channel. <gasps> coherence bandwidth. It, everything's coming together, right? It's really cool. So if we have that, and so what happens is, what's, so if we take the Fourier transform of this guy, we ha we, uh, you know, if it has the form of that uh, exponent, it turns out in the frequency domain it looks like this. Okay. Therefore, what we can do is we can express R2 k okay, as this guy here. And so now, what we want to do, okay, so now that we have this sort of formulation for the, for the channel correlation, uh, like, you know, how, how does the alpha get described? which is what we're attenuating our individual subcarriers with, what we want to do now is, let's say, if we have variations of the channel in, in, the, in the symbol interval t, so let's say, first of all, we assume that the coherence time is significantly longer or larger than the, the symbol period t. Okay? So what does that mean? So coherence time means we don't have any significant changes happening during each symbol. Thank goodness. If we did, things would be so messed up, right? So, slow fading, and then what you can use is a two-term Taylor series expansion to model these time-varying channel conditions, right? And so what happens is you get essentially this coefficient is equal to essentially a delta, and then you have, um, so you have this this Taylor series expansion that gets factored into it. And therefore, what happens is, let's say we have our baseband transmission. We represent it by a frequency modulated. So here's our, our, our individual symbols that are frequency modulated to a specific frequency f of k. So that's the k -th subcarrier. And then these guys are all summed together to give us s of t. Our received signal looks almost the same, except now we have these attenuation terms and we have noise added. And if we expand this out based on that alpha, we have that Taylor series expansion of the alphas that appear. And therefore, what happens is if we try and reconstruct 
SI, which is SI of hat. What do we get? So we get this guy here. This actually is our desired signal, just slightly attenuated. This, unfortunately, this stuff here, okay, ah, except for him. This stuff here is ICI. This is the stuff that's spilling over from one subcarrier to the other. Bad. And then, of course, noise. So, if we take the square, mean squared value of the desired signal, we get these terms here. And as for the ICI terms, let's go back to our time domain correlation value. And we see that if we calculate that, what we end up getting, so we go, so first of all, we equate this guy, because there's a time domain correlation, and we expand it, we actually see that it's equal to minus the double derivative of R1 tau, which then, if you take the Fourier transform, gives you 2 pi f squared s of f, that, so that's the power spectral density, okay, of, that's equal to, that's Fourier transform of, uh, so, so where did I get this guy? First order derivative, it's whatever's in the exponent, right? And second order derivative is again the exponent times itself squared. So, so in fact, it's going to be minus j 2 pi f t. So we're taking the derivative with respect to what? With t, right? So whatever, so that's the only thing that's based on time in that entire thing. So you have minus j 2 pi f comes down in the first derivative of r, right? The autocorrelation function. Take the second order derivative, the next guy comes, j times j is minus 1, and then er everything sort of multiplies together. So we actually get this ma magnitude squared term times the power spectral density. Because remember, um, like if, what is, what's derivative in the time domain? It's going to be basically uh, this thing in the frequency domain, right? So if we plug that back in to this expression for the mean squared value of this alpha uh, t prime term, we get this. And therefore, the power in the ICI term is equal to this expression here. So what happens is, remember, we, we saw this before. So what is the mean squared value? The, uh, what is the mean squared value of that ICI term? So it's this. We expand it out. We expand this guy out. So we basically take, we, what's the magnitude squared? We take this guy here and multiply by that same guy, complex conjugate. We expand them out. So that's why we have this messy thing here. We also have the side term here. And then finally, people were doubtful that there's a finally. If you go through it, you know that this is statistically independent. These are IID with zero mean. So what ends up happening is all this thing melts away. So what you're left with is the first term in the right-hand side. Okay? This guy, zip goes to zero, okay? And then if we work this through, what we really get at the end, this is my interference, my ICI power, right? So my in signal to interference for the ICI in my OFDM signal is equal to this. And if you want to know more in Proacus and Salehi, uh, you know, digital communications uh, version, uh, you know, uh, fifth edition, Section 13.6-2 gives you a little bit more detail about what I've just uh, covered here. So, um, so again, so, so what we've just seen, it's a little bit fast, but what I, I think uh, for the interested reader, I think there's, you can look at this in a little bit more detail. What you can see um, from this, this lecture is how you can calculate the theoretical performance of OFDM with ICI, which we did not talk about too much. We looked a lot of, at ISI in the cyclic extension. Um, here we actually have a little bit of a performance analysis on how ICI operates and such. So with that, so this, this concludes lecture 39. This also concludes um, this entire course. So we've, over the last um, 39 lectures, we've covered everything from 
sort of the signaling fundamentals, both representing waveforms in terms of, uh, uh, representing uh, different types of transmission techniques in terms of waveforms and vectors. Um, we also looked at sort of the performance analysis of these guys in terms of their power efficiency and their power spectral <coughs> densities and such. We then looked at how do we calculate in an AWGN environment that's not band limited. We looked at the performance of these systems. We then further investigated when we do have band limited scenarios. We looked at a variety of different equalization and realizations. Uh, we looked at dual binary and partial response signaling techniques. Uh, we then delved into um, other aspects of data transmission, including OFDM and, and spread spectrum communications, and, uh, and then kind of rounded out everything with respect to a study of diversity techniques. We also looked at frequency hopping um, um, uh, systems, and then finally a little bit of a potpourri of different topics. So we covered really a gamut of different techniques that are used in today's digital communication systems, hence the title of this course, Modern Digital Communications. Okay? So that concludes both Lecture 39 as well as uh, this course. Okay? Thank you. Okay. So, um, I guess we're not going to meet.